those who walk away from Hogwarts. How Professor McManus defeated House Slytherin. Part 1. The Fall of House Slytherin Perhaps it's a millennial defect in my soul, but I have an odd inclination to explain political ideas with references to Harry Potter. Actually, I'm not particularly fond of the books, but it's indisputable that they have captured the imagination of my generation and seem, in their own strange way, to hold a key insight into cultural life in the early 21st century. I think the Harry Potter series represents a kind of apex merger between the old world fantasy tradition and the height of the late 1990s boomer truth regime, each trope spun together seamlessly by a middle-aged woman with an acute talent for beat storytelling and absolutely zero self-awareness. What emerges is a strange type of narrative chimera, a captivating story that contains almost no wisdom, but also seems to perfectly represent the defect in our own modern cultural moment. A magical British boarding school? That's a pretty standard fantasy trope, but things start getting weird and modern when we try to locate our villains. We are, after all, thoroughly cosmopolitan people, so the evil force menacing our protagonists can't simply be some demonic spiritual threat, too religious, or some external invader, too xenophobic. The antagonists, reflecting the true modern nature of evil, have to be internal, political, and vaguely traditional, with roots running back to mid-century Germany and their chief moral failing being racism. J.K. Rowling seems to have given the subject of evil a lot of thought, but it never seems to come together. Black magic and dark magicians are shunned, students are taught to guard against them, and regulations against the dark arts seem to be a core part of the wizarding tradition going back for centuries. Yet practitioners of these dark arts, the Death Eaters, comprise the most blue-blooded and traditional caste in their society, the most connected to the ancient core of the wizarding world. In fact, despite their forbidden nature, the dark arts seem to be literally built into the foundation of Hogwarts, with one of its schools, Slytherin, dedicated to training a new generation of irredeemably racist 11-year-olds to practice black magic. Potter fans will likely jump down my throat at this stage. There is, of course, an in-universe distinction between House Slytherin and the Death Eaters, and the suggestion is always that the Slytherin characters who turn to evil are in fact making a choice due to a personal moral failing, perhaps racism? But really, to any discerning reader, this distinction between dark magic and Slytherin is obviously paper-thin, both in the text and in the imagination of the author. Not only is the Dark Lord himself a member and heir to House Slytherin, the members of House Slytherin, led by Harry Potter's personal rival, Draco Malfoy, spend most of their plot time, wittingly or unwittingly, trying to resurrect the in-universe equivalent of the Antichrist. And lest readers presume this connection to dark magic is a recent degeneration of a once proud tradition, Rowling informs her readers in the second book that, in fact, the founder of House Slytherin himself was a murderous racist who built secret death traps into the architecture of Hogwarts, presumably for the future use of racist dark wizards. For this reason, I've always found the Slytherin characters an interesting case study that reveals something bizarre in the mind of the Boomer author, especially later in the course of the series when Rowling is forced to humanize her antagonists. Here, the Malfoy family is primary, who, from Draco to his parents, Lucius and Narcissa, represent the classic blue-blooded wasp family so popular as villains in late 20th century fiction. Really, when the Malfoys aren't scoffing at the plebs, playing golf at their magical country club, or counting their trust fund doubloons, they are enslaving house elves and destroying unicorn habitat for fun and profit. And of course, it goes without saying, they are responsible for all the historic crimes of the wizarding world. Knowing all of this, it comes as no surprise to the reader that the Malfoys, along with most of House Slytherin, join up with the Dark Lord in the last book to fight the protagonists. Perhaps it's more surprising when the Malfoys repent of their evil ways during the last battle, just in time for that very boomer moment of narrative catharsis where the audience learns that even racists can be redeemed. By the series Denouement, we see Draco and his pure-blooded wife dropping their last scion off at the Hogwarts train station to be the classmate of Harry Potter's own child. There is a feeling of collegiality with some rivalry, but not malice. 
The Malfoy child will presumably be assigned to House Slytherin and play his role as the opponent to Potter's son in the school Quidditch games, but nothing more, and the proud Malfoy family will continue their legacy of breeding blonde and magical purebreds and practicing their Slytherin traditions, just in a less racist way. But really, does any of this make sense? Does anyone really believe that Draco Malfoy is Harry's equal in this post-Voldemort era? That House Slytherin now has equal standing with House Gryffindor at Hogwarts? That this new generation of children will meet on equal terms? There are literally war crime tribunals for allies of Voldemort, followed by recriminations and torturous jail times for his supporters. Are people going to forget the role the Malfoys and House Slytherin played? Presumably, Slytherin still represents its own legacy and intellectual traditions in the contests it faces against the other houses, a legacy now intimately connected to dark magic. But this being the case, how could the legacy of evil even be allowed to win? Wouldn't it jeopardize the narrative and safety of the new good political order? In reality, what has happened is that Rowling, in her earnestness to describe the moral and political reality of her time, has blithely written a straight-up moral contradiction into her fiction. The great perceived evil of our time is also a pillar of our historical legacy, academic institutions, and traditional social order. Our great Satan is one and the same as our great ancestor, and the traditions we honor and follow as part of our balanced liberal education are also the source we blame for all things wrong with modern society. But under these conditions, how can one square this circle? Maybe people need to be more open-minded and subtle in their perception of right and wrong? It's a good bet that Rowling, like most boomers, doesn't really believe in evil, so the problem all seems rather academic. But her millennial fans certainly do believe in evil. One of the first boomer truth regime illusions to be uniformly discarded by my generation, left, right, and center, is moral ambivalence. Something about growing up in the early 21st century West makes it impossible not to believe in genuine human wickedness and depravity. It's hard to look at the modern order and think that all roads in life lead inevitably back to the moral center. The devil walks among us, and woe to those who follow his path of deceit and iniquity. But that's the thing, isn't it? You don't bargain with evil. You don't go in for half measures. You reject it. You crush the serpent before it strikes your foot. The devil doesn't get equal time at the podium. Evil doesn't have an equal stock in the marketplace of ideas. The demons don't get their own football team at the Super Bowl, their own fraternity and university department. Beazelbub doesn't get to run his own political party. The idea that everything was up for debate is peak boomer delusion. What are we supposed to do? Sit around and debate whether maybe this year we can make things worse and more corrupt? What responsible society would allow genuine evil to play in a fair contest of chance when the stakes are real power? But then, returning to the world of wizards and Harry Potter, what is the necessary role of the Malfoys in House Slytherin? After all, in the moral and political frame of their universe, they are essentially and necessarily occupying the role of Team Evil. It's in their name. It's in their culture. It's in their blood. Can they leave it behind without leaving themselves behind? But if not, then what role can a good society give them? Perhaps the role of designated losers? After all, someone has to eat shit on the Quidditch field. And without a default bad guy, students' time at Hogwarts will certainly feel less epic. And I can't imagine the alumni of House Slytherin will fare much better in a professional setting. Really? Is an employer going to think the recent graduate from House Evil will be the best fit for their opening as a wizard of human resources management? Not such a bright future for Draco and Astoria, much less their son Scorpius. For me, the narrative disjunction here stood out like a sore thumb, and in the broader narrative of the Harry Potter universe, I noticed other millennial readers didn't exactly know what to do with the Malfoys and the other Slytherin, as evidenced by their own headcanons and fanfics describing what happened after the official curtain closed on Rowling's epic series. Okay, so the infamous Draco Malfoy is good now? Perhaps his allegiance to the Dark Lord was just a personal flaw. He was an asshole in high school. But then, who wasn't? And now he's better. But what, therefore, to make of his affiliation with House Slytherin and his evil family? Certainly, he needed to be publicly repentant, even guilty for his complicity in past evils. Perhaps a broader act of contrition was necessary? 
And this is where the progressive imagination of many Harry Potter fans seems to take a darker turn, speculating that Malfoy himself could only be redeemed by intentionally scuttling his native house Slytherin and the future of the Malfoy family, with some of the more radical narratives having Draco go full meine Blutlein endet mit mir and deciding to deny the Malfoy family any new heirs which might continue their wicked Slytherin bloodline into the future. Perhaps having the first baby was a big mistake? Knowing how these historical guilt narratives usually amp up over time, I dread to think what awaits the remnants of House Slytherin and the Malfoy family in the next generation. Will Draco's son be subjected to even harder guilt-inducing propaganda and be expected to perform ever more extreme forms of self-abasement to demonstrate fealty to the new moral order? Perhaps this time, once Slytherin is defeated by Gryffindor through the spontaneous deduction of their points for being on the wrong side of history, Scorpius Malfoy can lead the rest of House Slytherin in a spontaneous act of collective self-sterilization just to ensure the cursed genetic line is destroyed and there finally is an end to the racist legacy of Salazar Slytherin. I can imagine thunderous applause will erupt from the more progressively-minded houses. Progress at last, an end house Slytherin, finally the abolition of institutional anti-muggle racism at Hogwarts. We are the change we've been waiting for. But perhaps, too, there will be some murmuring unease among the crowd. After all, who will lose at Quidditch now? And is institutional anti-muggle racism really over? There's so much more to do. We have to struggle onward. The thing is, as J.K. Rowling herself learned all too well, once you move from a spiritual concept of good to a political one, the revolution can never really stop. There are new crusaders coming up through the ranks, wanting to follow the example of Harry Potter and looking for their own House Slytherins to slay. Perhaps House Hufflepuff is the new evil house? I heard Helga Hufflepuff made her fortune in the house elf slave trade. And did you know Rowena Ravenclaw believed in a biological basis for gender? I suppose that's why there are so many Ravenclaw bigots trying to keep trans witches out of the girls' locker room at Hogwarts. And thus the standard of progress always rolls forward, and the revolution eats its children. And as the purge continues, the richness of Hogwarts' legacy diminishes, bit by bit, the ancient wisdom shunned, and each chamber of particular and challenging secrets barred from access until the four dreaming spires of the school are consolidated into a monolith, from a magical place of learning to a staging area for ideological struggle sessions, recriminations, and witch hunts. Witness the Closing of the Wizarding Mind Part 2. Professor McManus and the Last Academic As a reader might have guessed, all of this blabber about Harry Potter and Slytherin is a not-too-subtle way to segue to a broader story about the modern academy's decline. At the risk of displaying resentment, as the lefties call it, I do have to admit a certain type of personal animus towards the modern academy. As a right-winger, people always accuse you of hate, but the only group I ever felt spied towards was my own class of white progressive academics. I suppose no hatred is ever justified, even if I do believe that my native people's hubris is responsible for most of the world's problems. Still, at an emotional level, it feels like I have a right to this resentment. After all, the modern academy was the world that created me. I was the son of two university lecturers, raised in a university town, and spent an embarrassing amount of my young adult life pursuing postgraduate degrees. And for the longest time in my early adolescence, I idolized academia, even hoping that I would someday become a professor of some humanities subject, pursuing the life of the mind and great ideas wherever they led. What always enchanted me about academics, at least of my parents' generation, was how much they loved ideas. They believed in them in a way that I found enthralling, even to witness, no matter how kooky the professor in question. Of course, I don't want to insinuate that this phenomenon was the undiluted pursuit of knowledge. There was an enormous amount of ego in this all. The academic was typically in love with his idea. But the center of the academic pursuit was still the idea itself, the knowledge, the belief, and the pursuit of truth. Yet something is quite different in my own generation of academics, especially in humanities and related fields. I could sense this change first in undergrad, and by the end of my PhD, 
I was thoroughly disillusioned with what the Academy had become, mandatory DEI statements and all. Yet somehow, until this year, I always held on to the fancy that somehow, had things gone differently, had the universities been managed well, or at least less politically, I would have been well-suited to be a university professor. I guess it's good to put away childish fantasies by looking at the thing you once thought you wanted soberly and realizing what it actually is. And, oddly enough, I don't think I would have fully completed this late realization without coming in contact with the online lefty personality and academic Professor Matt McManus. Now, I should emphasize here, I don't think Professor McManus is out of the ordinary, nor are his progressive views particularly unusual. Having written a number of articles and at least one book about the new right, McManus was one of the lefties pushing back against the new anti-progressive political movements online since 2015. I had spoken to Matt early in 2021 about his work on the right, provided some criticism, and then promptly forgot about him until he emerged in 2023, writing a response to Curtis Yarvin and the rest of the new right in the magazine Commonweal. I guess what immediately stood out to me about Matt was a certain similarity in our biographies. We are about the same age, the same level of educational achievement, and have the same disposition towards reading old books, yet our lives have ended up pushing in diametrically opposed directions. But what is really interesting about Professor McManus, for the purpose of this essay, is how perfectly he exists as an archetypical specimen of the millennial left-wing academic, starting with his political views. And what are those political views? At the surface level, Dr. McManus, like many other aspiring academics, stands at the forefront of modern social justice progressivism, still desperately trying to retain some of the pieties of the old academic tradition. Still some kind of Christian, McManus describes himself as a socialist officially, yet when pressed in public conversation, defers to advocating for the Nordic model, which is probably why so many of his interlocutors mistakenly believe he is a social democrat. The core of Matt's more rigorous political material consists of the familiar deconstructive critiques of traditional teleological worldviews in favor of modern progressive politics. The general form of his case, retracing familiar progressive arguments, amounts to insinuating that deconstructive philosophical schools emerging in the late 19th century, and validate classical approaches to knowledge, leaving progressive orthodoxy as the only valid philosophical contender. This is a common view, on the left at least, and a perspective that I have seen used many times against more classical philosophical outlooks. It starts with rehashing a general skeptical form that calls everything into question, and then follows it up with some cute modern progressive arguments, usually from John Rawls, to make the default lefty answers seem reasonable. Really, at this stage, answering these standard, view-from-nowhere, deconstructive critiques should be routine for any reasonably aware post-progressive, but for the neophytes in the audience, perhaps a rehash would be useful. To start with the obvious, modern, scientifically-inspired schools of critique derived from the work of Nietzsche, Freud, and Darwin are not narrowly tailored intellectual defeaters for classical ethical traditions. Instead, these perspectives are, in the words of Daniel Dennett, universal solvents. They are broad-based, extensive deconstructive attacks that reduce all human ethics to emergent properties and call into question all prescriptive moral sentiments. There is no get-out clause for the ethical perspectives that progressives like Matt enjoy using liberally in their own politics. Nietzsche's death of God does not come for the God of Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, leaving the God of Paul Tillich and Martin Luther King alive and well. The critique is extensive. It applies to all moralism and all sacred sentimentality, traditional or progressive. Attempts by the left to save their cherished political project from the deconstruction they apply to their enemies comprise an embarrassing catalog of sloppy thinking and special pleading. Invariably, the arguments amount to linguistic hat tricks, where philosophers smuggle their own preferred, specific teleological preferences in through the back door, while denying the existence of the concept generally. Furthermore, the attempt to appeal to will to power, or existentialism, to reconstruct ethical certainty, ends up being facile, since, just as the original critique deconstructs all forms of human value, an appeal to will brings them all back. Far from solidifying a progressive worldview, the approach creates a postmodern condition 
where no system holds validity and political power itself becomes the only determination for authority. But for philosophers like Professor McManus, trying to integrate the progressive political project with choice parts of the Christian worldview, the problem is even worse. Because the elements of the old tradition preferred by progressives, such as rights, equality, dignity, and compassionate universalism, rely more on the teleological and metaphysical core of the worldview than do the parts they hate, like hierarchy, practical inequality, and essentialist notions of identity. More to the point, as anyone will tell you who has read modern post-Hobbesian right-wing authors, the arguments for inequality and hierarchy do not rely on teleological presuppositions. Rather, they are a necessary and practical political response to material reality. To think that men are unequal and need to be treated as such, and to think that hierarchy works at getting things done, a person just needs to open their eyes and observe the material world of humans as they exist. But to think that all men are created equal and endowed with some invisible set of rights, that requires contact with a metaphysical and spiritual tradition. Dare I say a teleology? And it's for this reason, if no other, that postmodernity has a distinctly right-wing flavor to it. I make this digression not simply to dunk on McManus, but because it is important for the point that I am pursuing to understand that the problem we see here is not unique, but a general crisis of justification for leftist worldviews generally. Progressivism is an anti-ethical ethical tradition, an anti-teleological teleological perspective, and an anti-spiritual spirituality. It would, in any proper anthropological sense, be considered a religion, yet despite itself, the movement rapidly pursues secularism and deconstruction, less out of some procedural commitment to truth or discipline, but because it can be used as a pretense to disqualify its opponents and assure its puritanical dominance of the public square. These contradictions form the basis of a fundamental crisis in 20th century leftism. Initially, I think progressives understood the issue as a genuine academic question, with curious individuals looking for a solution. However, post-World War II, with the consolidation of military power in the U.S. and the consolidation of the academy under the new left, a practical political solution emerged, offering two complementary but contradictory narratives. First, for the respected blue professional and academic set needing to justify their own institutional power, modern progressivism became justified via technocratic performance and excellence towards serving people's needs, while steering clear of troublesome teleological and essentialist concepts. The task, after all, was proper management and best practices, nothing to do with moral or spiritual identities relying on metaphysics that the 19th century philosophers called into question. Alternatively, for the younger and more ideological set, in search of meaning, the left provided a revolutionary and identitarian formulation of itself. Progressivism was about fighting the evil of the old colonial order, tearing down systems of oppression, and uplifting the identity groups of marginalized people. And equality, or equity, would be achieved eminently through incremental reforms pursuing the endpoint of the broad civil rights movement. Here, leftism was core to establishing and vindicating one's internal spiritual identity and giving one's life narrative purpose. And both your identity and purpose were valid. Did these concepts of progress ever make sense in combination? No, not really. But for a time post-1960s, when the project was fresh and untested, and while the left was led by actual intellectual giants like Marcuse and Chomsky, the contradictions could be papered over. But things look different in the year 2023. Not only have broad civil rights regulations failed to deliver on the promise of racial equality and broad-scale societal cohesion, our uniformly progressive managerial class, ruling over the richest parts of Europe and North America, have demonstrated themselves singularly incapable of fighting the creeping social and economic decline of the West. Moderate progressive leaders furiously try to cover their asses with appeals to the latest outrage, while promising that the Halicon utopia of the Nordic model is just around the corner so long as the middle class pays out for the next activist boondoggle. But really, the problems go deeper, and the extent of the left's ideological failures can now be directly witnessed in the products of progressive educational institutions. The feminist project of the sexual revolution, 
after spending decades attacking traditional family norms, has manifestly demonstrated it has no idea how to get men and women to relate to one another and form stable family arrangements in a post-patriarchal world. And need we revisit the results of the moral philosophy being circulated inside the progressive professional classes? Apparently directing the young to define themselves in terms of sexual preference and grievance politics while prioritizing personal pleasure over the permanence of family and faith doesn't do wonders for your psychological health. Even in his intellectual decline, Jordan Peterson could have told you as much, but it's no longer speculative. The numbers are in, and it's hard not to conclude that the leftist worldview itself is a leading vector in the catastrophic decline in modern mental health, second only to the iPhone. As somebody who was raised in a progressive community, I can tell you this isn't what we signed up for. We wanted John Lennon's Imagine, and this is what we got? A generation of young men and women too angry to date, too sexually debauched to marry and reproduce, constantly sliding into misery and depression? Ladies and gentlemen, the fruits of progress. And I think it is for these reasons that we see the core contradictions of both left-wing projects, managerial and radical, come to a head on the issue of its enemies. The reactionaries, the right-wingers, the heretics from the leftist vision, the people who turn their backs on the tides of progressive modernity. Why do they exist, and what does a good progressive do with them? It's strange, looking back to older versions of the left-wing project, the idea of a political opposition wasn't very prominent. Now, in the early 21st century, Progressives can't stop thinking about right-wingers and the looming brown menace of fascism. The old left was propositional, focused on creating a better world for everyone, even the deplorable Slytherin types like myself who like God, big families, and blonde children with high cheekbones. The new left is oppositional, focused on holding back the ever-present threat of modern mid-century Germans resurrecting Dark Lord Mustache Man to spread whiteness around the world once more. As many have noticed, for the modern left, the existence of the right is more essential than ever. They need an enemy to give their own political project meaning, and a scapegoat to explain why the true promises of the left have not yet come to pass. However, the problems only start to materialize when progressives try to describe what their opposition is, and what role it plays as an oppositional force. For the managerial left, the political opposition must in some sense be integrated, adversarial, and collegiate. They are, after all, the smartest guys in the room. That's why they occupy the positions of prestige that they do, and the story of their ascendancy doesn't really make sense unless they have an open, academic, and adversarial relationship with their right-wing political opponents. For the radical, revolutionary left, the political opposition must be a great Satan an adversary of incredible threat and harmful potential that needs to be crushed absolutely so that good can thrive. They were promised a better world half past yesterday, and progressives aren't exactly thin on the ground in managerial institutions. Therefore, there must be, in fact, some incredibly powerful and maleficent force working behind the scenes to keep the new good world from coming into existence. Fight on, brave revolutionaries, because by fighting your adversaries, you are literally saving our lives. In reality, as most people realize, these stories are hogwash. The domination of intellectual spaces by progressive ideas owes to trends in political power post-World War II, not some hypothetical contest of wits that progressives won, much less the general ability of left-wing thinkers to notice, explain, and predict sociological phenomena. Furthermore, modern social ills and the fact that the civil rights movement's promises are not materializing cannot be laid at the feet of a secret fascist cabal of right-wingers. Christian monarchists and reactionary third position guys aren't sabotaging New York's ability to equitably enforce law and order or provide affordable housing to its law-abiding denizens. Tradcast school moms aren't preventing the progressive elites of Seattle and San Francisco from paying out billions to African Americans in reparations like they say they want to. Jim Bro Zoomers reading Bronze Age Pervert aren't causing 40-year-old progressive millennial women to sink deeper into mental illness, double-fisting SSRIs to overcome their anxiety and social isolation. But beyond the ridiculousness of their vilification, the bigger issue is how these contradictory descriptions of the right fit together. 
we are left once more with the problem of how a Slytherin. Is the right wing a legitimate adversary, a conversational partner with whom we are discerning a future in the messy process of democracy? Or alternatively, is the right wing a lurking evil, a snake in the grass that needs to be guarded against? The question is made all the more troublesome by the fact that the right wing is growing in strange new ways. No one on the new right really has any meaningful institutional power, but more elite people are beginning to doubt the progressive project, ask troubling questions, and come to very disturbing right-wing conclusions. Here is where our hero McManus enters the scene, armed with the confidence of modern academia and progressive moralism set to slay the dragon of postmodern reaction and restore pride of place to the true left-wing political project. It's a good niche for an academic since so few modern progressives want to take on the new right head-on, but Matt seems to have very little to say about the core progressive contradictions driving the resurgence of post-leftist thought, starting with the simple issue of how to honestly describe what the right is. From what I have read, Matt McManus seems to be following in the tried-and-true tradition of Theodore Adorno and Corey Robin, describing the right in taxonomic terms, pathologizing ideological differences, and insinuating when possible that right-wing thought itself is the product of a psychological defect. Early in McManus's project, I think this was easy enough, being published in the era when social media populism and plebeian blowhard leaders were rapidly eclipsing the more thoughtful right-wing perspectives on the scene and focusing largely on charlatans like Milo Yiannopoulos and crude political celebrities like Donald Trump, it was easy to portray the right as a brainless, knee-jerk political reaction to post-modernity itself. However, Matt's project became much more confusing post-2021, when the reemergence of neo-reaction and the post-left highlighted a new group of thoughtful writers, at odds with the general characterization of the right wing as fundamentally dishonest and anti-intellectual. Could Matt or any other thinker on the new left confront these perspectives without resorting to psychologizing, sassy personal attacks, or appeals to academic authority? For this reason, I regarded Matt's recent article on Curtis Yervin with some interest, and I could tell, reading it, that McManus was having some trouble defining a consistent narrative about the right wing he could sell to a modern leftist audience. On the face of things, it's obvious what progressive readers want to read— they want to read about a more or less rigorous way to dismiss troubling right-wing contentions and justify their moral condemnation of their political enemies. And if this was the only requirement, Matt could have probably gotten away with your typical point-and-sputter takedown piece. But I got the sense that Matt wanted to deliver some kind of legitimate intellectual body blow to neo-reactionary thought that might pass muster as a genuine academic case and so his response had to take a different form. In the end, it seems, McManus decided to focus on some of Yarvin's historical revisionist points made in unqualified reservations. Though far from the core of what draws people to Yarvin's writing, contesting factual historical points is a legitimate academic contention, and overestimating the strength of the mainstream narrative of events, I think the professor believed he had stumbled on the true weak point in Moldbug's case a flaw that could be used to legitimately discard his worldview as unserious. Therefore, repeating much the same lines as you will hear from any post-colonial freshman seminar, Matt McManus dispensed with the serpent of neo-reaction. However, probably to McManus's surprise, Yarvin replied back promptly to defend his heresies, supporting his claims with primary sources and books written close to the time of the events in question, Yervin asked earnestly if the mainstream narrative held up to independent scrutiny. If the history of the last two centuries was really as Howard Zinn described it, as Matt McManus describes it, how does one explain these testimonials, these relevant comparisons, the existence of the modern world? Yervin had plenty of questions based on well-documented texts and a series of very academic problems for the good professor. Certainly with such a collegiate attitude, could a modern academic defer from the challenge? Well, maybe. What resulted instead was less an intellectual dialectic than an academic Marx Brothers routine, with Matt McManus and his colleagues tripping over themselves to sputter out condemnations, calling Garvin's historical analysis lazy. 
Lazy, I suppose, because the independent analysis based on actual historic texts didn't obtain prior approval from the academic consensus it was meant to challenge. It was obvious that neither Matt nor any of the other lefty academic types wanted to take on Yarvin's factual contentions head on. And by the time I was leaving Twitter for Lent, Matt was quick at work inventing new campy epitaphs for Yarvin to demonstrate to his online progressive audience that arguments of these types just really weren't worth his time. Wanting to see the point pushed a little further, I reached out to Matt, asking him for the real reasons why an open debate with Yarvin couldn't continue. Eventually, Matt publicly admitted that the real reason he had no interest in continuing the conversation was less the nature of the question, but his opinion that Yarvin was acting immorally. Mind you, not for some specific action or intellectual dishonesty on Yarvin's part, but because Curtis Yarvin was a public advocate against progress and against egalitarianism, an opinion that apparently put extended public debate beyond the pale. And it's at this point I had to take a step back. I mean, sure, I get it. I'm a religious man myself, so I know how this works. Error has no rights, and in a sense all wrong ideas are immoral, and spreading wrong ideas is an immoral act. But liberal academia is not supposed to work this way. I can't answer Ibn Khaldun's historical perspectives by labeling him as an unrepentant Mohammedan. I can't refute Giordano Bruno's cosmology by labeling him a filthy heretic. The factual contentions and arguments must stand apart. This is the basis for all open intellectual inquiry. The reason why academic dialectics and the supposed marketplace of ideas works and we all just don't collapse back into religious wars. I know this. Matt knows this. And feigning ignorance is a trick McManus is performing. And this trick might work for some time yet, but not too much longer. And it really has nothing to do with some great argument Yarvin is making, or even the general correctness of his positions. Love him or hate him, as everyone knows, Curtis Yarvin has been very, very wrong about any number of things. The problem comes down to the fact that none of the ideas the left criticizes and condemns in Curtis Yarfin are at all original. The concepts Curtis uses to direct his worldview are old, very old, and in fact comprise a foundational pillar of the Western tradition. At the end of the analysis, if Yarvin is out of the conversation because of his anti-egalitarianism, who exactly is in? Just as there is no coherent standard of anti-slavery ethics that condemns Robert E. Lee, which does not also condemn George Washington, there is no moral standard that can condemn Curtis Yarvin for his anti-egalitarianism that does not also condemn Thomas Carlyle, Roger Scruton, David Hume, and Aristotle. Huge swaths of the Western tradition are now declared immoral and out of bounds. In fact, as it would seem, the vast majority of Western tradition is totally unacceptable, save a tiny corridor of thought beginning around Jean-Jacques Rousseau and only being properly completed by John Rawls. I think here perhaps Matt would defend himself by citing some special quality of the new right that makes it uniquely historically deplorable, beyond its simple anti-egalitarian tendencies. But this is transparent anachronism used in the service of post hoc self-justification, are we supposed to believe that the personal qualities of an eccentric San Francisco computer programmer with a penchant for old books trigger some deep disapprobation in the progressive imagination that wouldn't also be triggered by the racist white male philosophers of the Enlightenment, the slaveholding luminaries of the American Revolution, or men like Aristotle and Plato, themselves scions of ancient militaristic and slaveholding societies? Indeed, progressives are experiencing a real emotional reaction that tells them that these ideas are evil, but they misidentify the source of this emotion as some sort of new development on the right, when it really is a new development on the left. Progressives are experiencing the metastasization of their own leftist worldview from its considered liberal origins to a revolutionary puritanical hysteria, and now as the new attitude of the left creeps forward, it identifies ever more broad elements of human thought to be heretical and morally unacceptable. Is there a way around this problem for the honest progressive? There certainly are personal solutions. But for progressive academia, this new development is almost certainly fatal to the project of open inquiry. For example, Matt's supposed to be a modern liberal academic. So how does he describe his chief adversaries ideologically? 
Are the adversarial ideas well represented in his students and colleagues, and the intellectual tradition he finds worthy of debate? And if so, what is his relationship to the thinkers from these schools? Are they valued colleagues honestly examining hard political questions in a spirit of open debate? Or do they simply represent a moral failing, bearing some archaic defect that preemptively disqualifies their concerns from consideration? And really, in the professional academic context, it has to be one or the other. A school's job is to defend its wards from evil while exposing them to adversarial ideas, so the distinction between the first and the second must be very bright indeed. When you see a coet in the hallways of Hogwarts holding a copy of Salazar Slytherin's collected works, do you invite her to a seminar on magical lineage or report her to the school counselor as a potential security risk to other students? If the resident Quidditch fan waves a banner with House Slytherin's emblem before the big game, is he showing understandable house spirit or brandishing a hate symbol? If in a class on magical biology, a contrarian student brings up a topical point about the statistical differences in magical aptitude between muggle-born and pure-blood populations, is she presenting an interesting idea for discussion or an actionable threat to the well-being of the muggle-born students in the class? There need to be answers to these questions, and the answers can't suddenly change from one day to the next. You can't play Quidditch against Slytherin on Monday, then send them to Azkaban Prison when you're sore about losing on Tuesday. You can't invite the Malfoy family to a theological debate on Wednesday, and then charge them with blasphemy for arguing their side on Friday. Not if you want to present any semblance of academic integrity. There's a perennial challenge I issue to progressive thinkers who have dedicated their careers to studying evil right-wingers like myself. Can you, a progressive, come on my channel and earnestly try to persuade me and my right-wing community to join the political left? Even though this is an incredibly simple request, for the most part these activist types never say yes to the proposition. They never want to speak to the people they make a living speaking about. I guess here I should say almost never, because as an exception to this rule, and to his great credit, at the time of this recording, Professor McManus has tentatively agreed to do just this, sometime early, summer of 2023. Still, the good professor was very hesitant about the necessary framing of this discussion, and, although academic integrity compelled him to the terms, I can tell Matt did not really relish the prospect of speaking in a persuasive capacity to a right-wing counterpart on equal terms, even if he couldn't explain his reservations in so many words. Since I don't like to draw people into rhetorical traps that could damage their careers, I will here lay my cards on the table and explain why progressives like Matt are right to regard such discussions with trepidation. In brief, the reason for this hesitancy to engage in dialectic is because the overarching practical political narrative of the left relies on there being no collective and legitimate non-progressive political concern. Once a right-wing community or political force is framed as a client, as a concerned party with needs to be met and legitimate values to be addressed, the modern leftist KFOB falls in a heap. The progressive party cannot simultaneously portray itself as caring, authentic, and concerned. More immediately, in any persuasive dialectic with a right-winger, a leftist would have to face any number of hard questions about a set of ineffective and vindictive social democratic policies that have demonstrably destroyed human health and cohesion throughout the West. And, since the frame excludes the common rhetorical dodge tactics, smart-sounding leftist answers to these concerns would not be forthcoming. There are honest responses, and there are the responses that the left-wing orthodoxy considers correct, each being, more often than not, in direct contradiction with the other. But the core issue is yet more fundamental, since the simple act of engaging with a thoughtful right-winger in a frame that portrays them as a party with legitimate concerns destroys the core narrative of the new left, which needs its political opposition to be simultaneously incompetent and demonic. To return once more to the Hogwarts example, Suppose one day Harry Potter, using his cloak of invisibility, happens upon Headmaster Dumbledore in a discussion with Lucius Malfoy about how Hogwarts' curriculum will benefit the Malfoy family and increase the reach of House Slytherin's academic tradition. What has Harry witnessed? Not much. This is only Dumbledore engaging in good academic best practices, a collegiate discussion with a parent and client as to how best manage the school's pursuit of proper student development. Yet how different would the reaction be had the topic changed only a little bit? 
perhaps with Malfoy and Dumbledore discussing how best to increase the interests of the Death Eaters and spread the practice of dark magic among the student body. In that case, Dumbledore is guilty of high treason and deserves to be sacked, if not sent to Azkaban prison. The distinction between client and wrongdoer, between alternative academic idea and pernicious social iniquity, is bright indeed. See the distinction? I'm sure you do. I'm sure Matt does. But you know who doesn't? Virtually all of Matt's younger progressive audience. Here, it's very important to understand that the failure is not personal, but institutional and generational. Even if Matt McManus bites the bullet and takes up my difficult offer for conversation, he will only manage to escape repercussions through a combination of wits and luck, which might not always be there for him. And as the generations shift, the window to pull off this kind of stunt will close, as the ideological basis for the permanent revolution solidifies. And therein lies the fundamental political lesson for myself, the only emotionally solidified at this late date, post my interaction with Professor McManus. In our age, in our special civilizational epoch, being an honest, institutionally affiliated academic is impossible. And, as I would like my more right-wing Nietzschean listeners to note, the problem lies less with some issue in leftism than in our modern relationship to knowledge and ideas. Once the death of God has been sincerely proclaimed, once the world is disenchanted, once our leaders believe that there is no greater source of truth or goodness that binds them to the pursuit of either, then the relationship between man, power, and inquiry changes fundamentally. Revolutionary and political values will necessarily eclipse the spiritual and religious ones. The managerial imperatives will become crudely utilitarian, and the core use of adversarial debate and the testing of ideas will become subsumed by the need to achieve rank political ends. Despite what liberal pronouncements institutions make at their outset, without a higher commitment to spiritual ethos, the managerial perspective will always become enthralled with the politicized ideology, killing off inquiry in the name of activism and expediency, which is to say, killing truth in the name of power. Because in the absence of God, in the absence of any telos, power is all that remains as a justifying force for inquiry and argument, no matter how many beautiful progressive-sounding words we use to describe its conclusions. The great irony for modern aspiring professors like McManus is that the professional stature of academic life he covets is practically prohibited by the post-heliological worldview he confesses. Eventually, postmodernity turns everything into politics, and politics consolidates into power-hungry activism, in turn destroying any belief in persuasive dialectics. But once a thinker leaves persuasive conversation by the wayside, he's no longer performing the role of a classic professor like Dumbledore. Instead, he is following in the footsteps of Harry Potter's own profession and has become an auror, or, as we call them in the non-wizarding world, an inquisitor. And I say this as a post-progressive myself. I understand the need for inquisitors. It's not a profession that attracts my ambitions, but it is still a profession that is sometimes needed in a just society. I respect the office, so to speak, and we all think Gregor Eisenhorn is a badass for a reason. However, even if necessary, what grants the Inquisitor his nobility, and what justifies his rage, is the slithering and deceptive nature of heresy, which promotes seductive and harmful ideas under the camouflage of lies and misrepresentation. But the office of the Inquisition loses all dignity when it hides its purpose and conviction behind a deceptive pretense of being an academic, much less when the ideas it defends are actively and manifestly destroying humanity. And if this disgusting farce is what the modern university seeks to train, the only thing it can train, then I want absolutely no part in this endeavor. Part 3. Those Who Walk Away From Hogwarts at this point, I arrive at the part of my essay relevant for longtime readers and friends. The only subject topical to her own period of crisis in the early 21st century, buried under two digressions about internet fights and pop culture. As always, what remains for us dissidents is to cultivate the right attitude that will help us survive in postmodernity. We can talk all we want about decline, ridiculous, out-of-date worldviews, and hilariously self-contradicting entertainment products but it does not get us out of needing to answer this larger, more serious question. Would I insult the reader too much by continuing to explore the issue through references to Harry Potter? In fact, the topics are not so disconnected in my mind, autobiographically, 
as the article that encouraged me first to pick up Rowling's young adult opus was also one of the first articles that made me question the tone and direction of modern culture. At the time, I remember having a good number of friends into Harry Potter, first ironically as a guilty pleasure, and then later as nerd culture became a thing, as a self-professed and ironic part of their own identity, increasingly becoming more sincere. At the time, thinking the craze was more than a little embarrassing, I scoured the internet for scathing reviews of Harry Potter and came across quite a notable review by the author A.S. Byatt in the New York Times. Strangely enough, Byatt, herself famous for writing what will perhaps be the last academic romance novel, actually had something to say. Rather than simply taking Rowling to task for her juvenile plot and predictable indulgent storytelling, the author pointed out a deeper absence in Harry Potter that also inhabited most modern fantasy literature. For whatever reason, these newer tales possessed a near absence of genuine mystery and romance that in one point was core to stories that described the fantastic. In modern fantasy, the sense of the deep and the mystical was replaced by more tired and tame entertainment archetypes that could be easily digested by a mass audience. I remember reading of this absentness and thinking back to the recently released Peter Jackson adaptation of Lord of the Rings. No matter how much Jackson's movie series was able to capture the look and feel of the books, the films seemed to be missing something essential about what Tolkien was trying to express. Or as Bayat put it when describing Rowling's writing, the modern magical world has no place for the numinous. Afterward, I remember voraciously consuming the Harry Potter books, looking for this absence. And while I found the books more entertaining than I imagined, I could see what Bayat was talking about. Everything in Harry Potter's universe felt institutional, on rails. It was all part of a formula and a predefined process Potter and his friends were experiencing, but which never really challenged them to the core of their souls. It's not that there weren't evocative elements in Rowling's universe. It was that the plot seemed to be constantly cutting away from them, directing readers' attention back to the petty plot elements that would keep the novel's beat storytelling churning along. For the longest time, I took it as an entertaining mental exercise to imagine how one might fix Harry Potter. How might a skilled author redirect the plot and the cast of characters so that they might explore the deeper and more cathartic human elements of the wizarding world? And here, my thoughts returned to House Slytherin. After all, post the canonical book series, Slytherin was on the outs. They were the underdogs, the villains, and if the Harry Potter extended universe followed its own logic soon to be exiles from the world they once considered to be their dominion. But in that dispossession lay a certain bizarre liberty. They were leaving the world of Hogwarts, but they were also leaving the world of institutional magic, bureaucracies of sorcery, enchantment sold for silver and gold, and worse yet, the world of politicized academia. What remained after all that was gone? Nothing but themselves, their values, their talents, and an old magical world. If the Slytherin exiles kept their pride and their heads steady, what would they find in the wilds of the magical realm beyond the imagination of Hogwarts? Perhaps the Numinous? When it comes to my own community of distance, my own fellow travelers, and my own family even, I sometimes like to think of us in the position of a newly exiled Malfoy family. How would a Draco, Astoria, and Scorpius face a new hostile world, naked, and without the institutional support they once imagined. Where should they go? What should they hope for? And what should their priorities be? And what would be the things they held dear, and defended firmly against every darkness? You can never really leave the place that created you, but exiles can't take everything with them. So what to keep and what to leave behind? And is there a new life to be had if exile is indeed eternal? Here, I think, there are many lessons for us, some sober, some comforting, and some harsh. I think the first lesson for those newly exiled comes down to developing a sense of acceptance. Do not be the ones who orbit around the Hogwarts that exiled them. Be the ones who walk away. Do not lament the institution that turned you to the winds. I suppose I can thank Professor McManus for completing this process in my own mind, if only the penultimate step. Still, there are far too many of us who in different ways wish to see the old world come back, and dedicate an insane amount of their time to lamenting over its corpse. This is one of the greatest pitfalls of the dispossessed, because nostalgia is in fact your tormentor's last cruelty. The reason why exile 
is so frequently a capital punishment. Man is not an island. He needs the polis to define him and give his life purpose. And for those born into such an over-socialized reality, the narrative of the modern world defined every aspect of our beings, even as we raged against it. Do we even know what we are on the other side of our departure from it? Eventually, I think, the only solution will be psychological separation, a breaking of ways with the narrative frame of the old world. Whatever else is truly good and beautiful, whatever it is you left when you turned your back on Hogwarts, it does not define your identity. You are no longer House Slytherin. You are no longer a conservative, or a Republican, or even a patriot. These are institutional relationships that only now act as a millstone around your neck, dragging you into the suicide of an old order. But in this process of separation, is there nothing to be salvaged from what we once knew about ourselves and the things we used to believe? Not at all. Let's start at the beginning, with the difference between good and evil, light and darkness, order and chaos. Whatever else is forgotten, this must be remembered. The old order called us devils, because they needed a devil to cover the tracks of their lies. But we are not devils, nor should we be tempted to their cause simply despite our former adversaries, though many, I'm afraid, will take this path. Whatever else was untruth, the existence of chaos and the dark arts were very real, and they remain no less ruinous now than ever. Our ancestors knew this all before the first stone of the old world was set in place. Will this again have to be relearned through hard experience? If so, it will be a deadly lesson for both body and soul. But after the threat of spiritual ruin, there remains the question of what might lead us forward and give us greater purpose. Perhaps we can start with the things that we can't leave behind. Our faith, our families, the bond to our posterity, and the link to our ancestors— and what remains of our heritage, even after the severing of all institutional bonds. Here, there are some tricky questions, the fine line between the songs and spirit which might provide hope for the future, and dangerous nostalgia that might chain us to a dead dream. How, for instance, would the exiled Malfoys now look back on the annals of their ancient family and the men of their tradition who forged their magical heritage? It's difficult, certainly. Our ancestors will always be with us, and there is always a way in which we cannot escape their influence. But just like Lot's wife, there is a danger in looking backwards, as the power of the past has a habit of obsessing the mind, never allowing us to make a new start. Here, I have already noticed two dangers. The first is a kind of reflexive recrimination against the old order, trying to find the source of the past decline by attacking working traditions because they were the immediate location of the previous catastrophe. To me, these efforts always appear like a parent trying to cut the healthy lungs out of a child because their grandparents died of lung cancer. This mistake has many becoming retroactive fire marshals for a world that has long passed, enacting preemptive, controlled fires long after the forest has burned down, and they should be looking for seedlings to replant. Another symmetrical mistake is to turn one's existence into a type of Egyptian cult of the dead, worshipping the romance of some past golden age that existed once and will never return. We were great in the past, now no more, and the rest of our collective existence must be a funeral procession to decorate the grave of a world that can no longer be. But really, in a state of decline and exile, how can we regard a past that is larger than us, dwarfing us both with its majesty and degeneration, its extreme depravity and impossible heroism. The only option is to maintain perspective. Perhaps the way an exiled Malfoy family might regard the contradictory heritage of a Salazar Slytherin. For instance, was there any validity in Salazar's penchant for pure-blood magical lineage? Maybe. It almost certainly was based on some kernel of truth. But how relevant is that particular truth in the New Age, when the boundaries that constructed the distinction are crumbling down. After all, there will be half-blood and muggle allies, which the Malfoys will need to survive, even if there remains a separation at some level. And rank bigotry, or condescension, is a luxurious vice hardly affordable to the destitute. And so, following a new sense of realism, a modern Malfoy may look back on Salazar Slytherin with nuance, a person with many talents, much wisdom, some obsessions and some failings, but very much a man of his time. 
only appreciable as such. Because whatever virtues or vices Salazar Slytherin may have possessed in life, whatever wisdom he might have created, which still exists, the man is dead, and there is no use in making the future a slave to his legacy. The only way to guard your own family's bloodline and find a new way for it to thrive is to seek its good within the actual challenges and opportunities of the world around you, pure blood, half-blood, or muggle. Will this involve breaking faith with some structures of the old order to find a new way? Perhaps. There is most certainly a trade-off here, and not an easy one. Our ancestors, even those long removed from us in time, do pass judgment on what we have built in this very different world. And for those of us who must, by necessity, take a different path, the only way to rightly address the challenge of the past is to cleave ever closer to the spirit of what our ancestors loved, even as we might cleave away from some of the forms they promulgated. People call me a traditionalist online, but I don't really advocate for anything traditional per se, just things that I find useful for the cause of life. After all, the dead things must remain in their graves until judged by a higher power. They have no right to the future independent of the truth, goodness, or beauty they point to. I don't tell people that they should read old books because they are old. I don't tell people to believe in God just because religion is good for society. I don't put forward Christianity because Jesus was a part of our heritage and a hero who died nobly. No, the only reason you should read a book is that there is something true or beautiful in it. The only reason you should believe in God is that God exists and is present in every moment of existence. And the only reason you should follow Christ is that he is alive. And this brings me to the final and most poignant lesson for the dispossessed, the imperative to find new life. There is an old life that failed us, never to return. But where does new collective vitality start? Almost certainly with the concept of the numinous. We stand now in a strange and dark wilderness, a middle place between a dying old order and a crawling chaos that might devour us all. And yet these conditions, though dire, are ideal for our purposes of discovering new transcendence. Out there remains an untamed world, with beasts that our ancestors once knew, but which are no less dangerous now. There will be dragons, not as elements of a game, but as menacing predators bringing ruin in their wake. There will be contests with mortal consequences on all sides, demons that can corrupt body and soul, and treasures that if won, can secure a new future and perhaps even a better world. This new world will require struggle, but our peril is poetic, because it is only in these wild places that we can accomplish our task to rediscover purpose, since purpose is the possession of a wild god. However, through this all, there is one imperative that I want my listeners to remember on their journeys, so long missing in our own society, the imperative of love. Here, I don't just mean love for each other and our families, but love for higher things, chief among them truth, the virtue of sincere curiosity. It is exactly this curiosity that the old world forgot and which doomed it to a mechanical and dull ruination. But if we can yet see further into those mysterious places of wonder and danger and not turn away, that fire may be kindled anew. Because it is only through a love for the truth, with all of its challenges, complexities, and mysteries, that real magic may be discovered, and the whole world made enchanted once more.